You're gonna need a bigger boat. I fart in your general direction! You talking to me? We're going to talk about iconic props from the 1970s. It is the best decade of filmmaking in the history of cinema. The birth of the blockbuster. The birth of New Hollywood. Yeah. Poppy knows exactly have you, what we're talking about. Have you seen about. any movies from the 1970s? I have. I have. I've seen uh, maybe three or four. I'm Scott Prop and Roll, and welcome back to Prop Guys React. We got Mark, Poppy, and... Matt in the back. And today we're going to talk about iconic props from the 1970s. You know, the 70s. It was the decade before the 80s. Most of you guys weren't alive probably, but believe me, there's some good stuff to take a look at. First blockbuster. Was it Jaws or was it Star Wars? What do you think? Jaws really was considered the first blockbuster, although the Godfather kind of started it. And they call it a blockbuster because people were lined up around the block. I have seen Jaws. If you hadn't. And Star Wars. I would have walked the out. Okay, the first one's pretty obvious. I'm going for the lightsaber in Star Wars. That's an easy one. Yeah, that's probably the most iconic prop of the 70s. Maybe of all time. It's a laser sword, right? Lucas came up with this idea, but then they had to make it real, so. And you know what it is? It's a Graflex flash handle off one of the old antique Graflex cameras. It's actually a Graflex Model 3 huh. flash handle. It plugged on to the side of a Graflex camera. So they basically removed the flash. That would be where the saber actually extends from. Correct. Okay. Yeah, that would have been a flash bulb. The story was that either the prop guy or production designer found this, like he was just looking at a camera rental place. The set decorator. He's thinking that there might be something camera related that could work for this handle he's Hello. looking for. Yeah. And he pointed me to some boxes under a shelf. I pulled it out and there were the Graflex handles. I don't even have to do anything to this. And there's like four of these things and they're just like perfect. Yeah. Not a whole lot of modification. And you know what I don't know is if they just did it, treated it like a fencing sword. There's like a dowel. Whenever you watch it, when they do it, there's like a little, you see a stutter, almost like a stop motion cut. And I think what it was is they literally either attached the dowel or switch, did a cowboy switch. The effect of the lightsaber was a rotating pole that had movie screen material applied to it so that it would reflect its light source back at many times the intensity. And then they went back in, I think frame by frame and added yeah, it's the light. But that's something to dig into. I'm sure mm. we'll get a lot of comments about it. So we have Marathon Man, a classic thriller from the 70s with Dustin Hoffman, Lawrence Olivier, Roy Scheider, directed by John Schlesinger. So the iconic prop is the dental drill that Sir Lawrence Olivier uses to torture Dustin Hoffman. That's the most remembered scene of the movie. He's torturing him with dental tools. So you can imagine how awful that would be. Some people walked out because it was so affecting. Conrad Hall, who's the director of photography, one of the best DPs ever, he wanted to see a little contrast in the cord because the cord was black. So they added a cord that was white. You see him plug it in and then there's a close up of the drill going in and you see this white cord coming out of the back. If sure. it was black. The cord just disappears. Right, basically. exactly. It's funny that you see something though that is being subbed out for something white. Most of the time DPs don't want anything white because they it's too reflective, it's too bright, it calls your attention. But Schlesinger knew how he was gonna shoot it. He knew he was gonna do a close up of the drill going into the guy's mouth, but then cut away and let the audience kind of, you know. Imagine. Imagine. What's told in like sound. Yeah. Uh, Somebody wanted Schlesinger to shoot a close-up of it actually touching, touching the tooth. So they shot it and apparently special effects worked on making a little puff of smoke when the drill hit a tooth, but they didn't use it because it's more effective without it. But. He looks like he knows what he's doing. He knows the drill. You guys, that, that's a real mouthful. Drill! 
<laughs> so this is uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Yes. It's one of my favorite movies growing up. Me too. Um, I have seen it. King Arthur and, and Patsy. They use coconuts to mimic the horse hoof sound as they're running. This is how the movie opens. The smoke clears a castle and then over the hill comes King Arthur and Patsy and he's got the coconuts and this was the first bit that they discussed for the movie. That it's funnier if they don't have horses, even though the budget didn't really allow for it anyways. Ridden on a horse? Yes. You're using coconut. What? You've got two empty halves of coconut and you're banging them together. The iconic prop is so front and center. Yeah. You can't think about the Holy Grail and not think about exactly the coconuts. And you buy it. The whole rest of the movie, like you don't even yeah. think about it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, well, one Foley artists use coconuts to, to, to replicate I horses. I mean, running. I don't know. Maybe a Foley artist will join in on the comments and tell us what would you use for a horse hoof? But That's more of how they would sound on pavement. On a hard, on a hard surface. With horseshoes. Right. Not so much out a, in a, a grassy landscape. I bet they did it for radio broadcasts. It's a western, and you'd hear the clippity clop. They got that from somewhere. A five ounce bird can't carry one it's, pound. Coconut. It's funny because it's so ridiculous. They're trying to throw the logic at you, and, and the logic's not about the horses. It's about the coconut. Are you suggesting coconuts migrate? Not at all. A, a good runner-up for the coconut shells would be the rabbit. That's pretty good, too. <laughs> yeah. That runs. Do you remember? It gets built up by the guy they run into. He's like, that's a huge monster. <laughs> and they get up there, and it's this rabbit. And the guy goes to kill the rabbit, and it flies Fun. up and, like, bites his head off. And <laughs> Arthur's like, Jesus Christ! <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ! If anyone watching hasn't seen Monty Python's Holy Grail, do yourself a favor, watch it. All right, so we have a iconic horror cult classic, Phantasm. And there are these chrome spheres that fly through this mortuary and kill people. They're kind of the weapons of the bad guy. See, here it comes. And um, so the kid bites him. You see the knives come out of the sphere. It's pretty graphic. Oh! Uh. And there you go. <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh. oh, see, look at that. How did they sell this to the distributor? They die with balls to the face? <laughs> Pardon me. Hmm. So Don Coscarelli, he directed it, and the sphere idea came from a dream. He was, like, running down a hallway, and he was being chased by this chrome sphere, um, although it did not have any weapons on it. That was added when they discussed it for the movie. This was made by a special effects prop maker in LA named Willard Green. The way they shot it, which is the classic low budget way, is they shot it backwards. I was gonna, uh, I was gonna say. Or they shot it and then That's played it. That shot? So this is the backwards, see? So basically what it is, is they literally just threw the ball like they were pitching the ball. And then, so it starts on a high trajectory and then it would go down and then they reverse it. So a lot of the shots, the ball comes in low and then it goes up. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, real kind of rudimentary uh -huh. stuff. I know that when they first shot it, they had a lot of trouble, but then they realized they couldn't light the ball itself. They had to light everything around it. So they had to mm -hmm. light the walls. They had built like a little wall that would go in front of the camera with a little round hole in it so that... So you don't see the cameras? Yeah. It doesn't look that scary. He's, he's having a ball. <laughs> he's having a ball. Wow, you're really good at playing that, Scott. All right, well, I'm not actually playing it because I got Poppy right here. And that's exactly how they did the banjo scene in Deliverance, Doolin' Banjos. All right, so in this scene, you have Ronnie Cox grabs his guitar and a local kid has the banjo they're playing dueling banjos together. Problem is the kid that they liked that had the perfect look could not play the banjo. So they had an experienced banjo player hidden behind, they had sleeves cut in a shirt and somebody hid behind and, cause look, those are kind of man hands for the, yeah. as young as the kid is. <laughs> they had an experienced banjo player doing it for most of it. Huh. The only time you see it is either over the shoulder or this really low angle. 
mm -hmm. or you can't tell. Yeah, because yeah. there I, it's actually the kid, but when you get through those tight close-ups, you can almost see the hand. Well, I think different. he's strumming, but I think the other hand is not. It's yeah, the, it's the guy. Oh yeah, because it's almost like you could learn that, you know. Yeah. Yeah, especially when you get into the fast portion at the end. Yeah. What's interesting is they kept it a secret. So the guy that actually performed it didn't get any credit for it. For years and years, he, you know, he he had signed a, a non-disclosure agreement and couldn't say anything. I, I don't know what the statute of limitations was, but finally he ended up saying, you know, that was me. Hmm. And other people corroborated the story, so. <laughs>so here we have alien this scene is with the eggs roger christian the art director talked about they had a few that were practical and they would they would open up but they had a lot that were for background but they would open up on the on the inside and they they used a, a sheep's stomach for the the top portion so the membrane is a sheep's stomach yes, yeah, yeah. well that's gross you forget how good it is yeah because it's got like this the translucent you see the you see the the, the face the, hugger in on the inside moving around Ridley Scott actually put uh, like a rubber glove on and he's the one who manipulated alien when it's when it oh. flies out so he would put his hand underneath and throw out the uh, you know octopus looking thing ooh uh oh yeah that don't uh, do it that's there's a sheep, this, sheep's oh, stomach. Yeah, because look at it. It's so yeah. gross. Oh, God. And the effects. Oh, no! For 1979, the visual effects in this were better than anybody had seen. But what's really funny is the trailer for this was done with a store-bought chicken egg and a platter of brownies. And that's all it is if you look at it. It's just the camera moving over a baking pan full of brownies up to an egg. Ridley Scott, you know, he was a art director prior to this. So he was really always extreme. He still is extremely involved in the production design. It's hard to beat the original Alien. I don't it's know. It's just so I, good. Personally, I like Aliens better. <laughs> well, this is from arguably the best movie of the 70s, if not the best movie ever, which is The Godfather. Has lots of iconic props in it. This might be one of the most memorable, and it is the horse head. The movie producer has fired Johnny Fontaine. This is the threat. Basically, if you don't put Johnny Fontaine back in the movie, this is what's gonna happen to you. Oh. Ah! 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 Okay, so story. We apologize for the animal loves out there, but this is a classic scene. The production was provided with a horse head, so it was this old horse head that was not realistic. It was like made of leather. It was like splitting. So as soon as Coppola saw it, apparently he was like, that's not gonna happen. So they literally found a horse that was, I read that they said it had emphysema. So it was a real horse head that they had. And they, they transported it in this very large metal box. And this actor was a very challenging guy to work with. So there were, I think there was a part of these guys, they were kind of excited to do this to him. <laughs> so he wasn't aware of what was gonna happen. And there's this horse head that's on dry ice. And he was not excited. And they put it in the bed and you know, it's all fake blood, but he like, you know, had his legs like pulled up cause he didn't want to touch it, you know? And Coppola apparently kept telling him, you gotta straighten out <laughs> cause they were messing with him. Mm -hmm. And after they shot the thing, the actor stormed off and kind of like was throwing stuff. And I don't know if he had more to do that day, but he left for the day and they he, didn't see him again. He was not happy about it at all. Yeah. Andy Graham. All right, so I pick the Narragansett beer can from Jaws. I'm sure not everyone thinks of this as an iconic prop, but I do. The whole East Coast would think so as well, because this is a very popular beer on the East Coast 
so much so that years later they made a commemorative Quint beer can. It looked just like this, and it says 1975, and it says Quince Beer. But if we're going to say this is iconic, you might want to say the uh, Styrofoam Cup is iconic as well. Yeah. What I will say is cans up until like the early 70s were steel. However, this and what Quint has, it's not steel, it's aluminum. But I think they were just doing aluminum East Coast. So when most of the country saw this, they were like, wow, how does he crush that can? Because they weren't introduced to aluminum cans till more, I guess, past 1975. But there were a few companies like Narragansett where they had aluminum uh, factories that were starting to switch their equipment over to make aluminum cans. Based on everything I know about this movie and behind the scenes, I could almost guarantee that Robert Shaw is drinking a real beer there. Mm -hmm. In fact, the classic... The, the speech. The speech. In the boat. If you really pay attention, his demeanor kind of changes. Well, you know the thing about like shark's eyes, Chief? Black. He's got lifeless eyes, black eyes like a doll's eyes. You know the thing about a shark? He's got lifeless eyes, black eyes like a doll's eyes. All right, so here we've got Game of Death, Bruce, Bruce Lee. And he's got nunchucks. Yes. Popularized maybe because of this movie? But anyways, very iconic. The story goes that he couldn't appreciate the nunchuck at the time. The uh, other actor here, Dan Inosanto, I believe is his name. He actually introduced Bruce Lee to the nunchucks. Apparently he mastered them in about three months, which is impressive in and of itself. Yeah. Uh, but uh, apparently Bruce Lee had a, his own take on this. He designed his nunchucks for this movie to match his uh, jumpsuit. They were, they had multiple versions of what they made. They had a, you know, like a balsa wood. I'm sure they had some rubbers as well. Mm -hmm. And, um, but it's cool. He put his own spin onto these and really was hands-on in helping design it for this. Yeah, pretty iconic look. And of course, this was the inspiration for the bride's outfit in Kill Bill. Mm -hmm. Tarantino used the yellow jumpsuit with the black stripe. This might have been Bruce Lee's last movie. Is this the movie he died uh, on? You're right. I think they might have finished it with doubles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think he died when they were still shooting. Yeah. They're all gonna love it! <laughs> Carrie! It's the bucket of blood. It's hard to think about this movie and not think about this scene. So what, our iconic prop is the bucket of blood? Yeah. Which is supposed to be pig's blood. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a whole sequence of following the string up to the rafters, up to the cross beam, and onto the bucket. It's really good to palm it. This entire sequence is done in slow motion. Now, our audience doesn't know this, but Sissy Spacek is your aunt. Yes. So my question is, how old were you when you saw this for the first time? I was a toddler when it came out. You know, I don't think I saw it until I was probably in my maybe early teens, maybe less, I don't know. So they purposely didn't let you see it, but you knew you knew your aunt Aunt Sissy was yeah, in a I horror mean, movie. Growing up, I would go to my grandparents' house, her parents, and the room that my brother and I would sleep in at my grandparents' house was her old room, and they had decorated it with posters of her movies. There was a Carrie poster, the one where it's <laughs> like it's like the split where she's like clean and then bloody. That was an image in my head mm -hmm. for years. So it's Cairo syrup, red food dye. You know, I did some research because I knew stories from growing up, but it's actually my uncle who's pouring it on her head. Because my uncle is the production designer of this movie, or he actually was the art director. Mm -hmm. They didn't really use that term much. The pig's blood was actually Carol syrup in food coloring. And the great thing about Carol syrup is it didn't smell. Because they had met on a movie, Badlands. He did that as the production designer. He also did Phantom of the Paradise, which was De Palma's film before this. But literally he was just on a ladder with a bucket and it was action dump. And I think they did two takes total 
you know, the lights and there's also some fire that happens. She like sets the room on fire. And so mm-hmm. that Cairo syrup was just kind of like baking onto mm-hmm. her. And, you know, she had to be covered in that stuff for two days, I think. Probably had to put on the same bloody dress. Yeah. Have you ever gotten a personal account from her on? I mean, I just remember hearing Cairo syrup all the time yeah. growing up. You know, we would be eating pancakes <laughs> with Cairo syrup <laughs> and it would come up. <clears throat> so I've got a story. I was uh, six or seven years old. I went to see a movie called The Hindenburg and we snuck in to Carrie. Really? And saw, mm-hmm. it, as we went in, it was the big jump scare with the hand coming up out of the grave. It was the end of the movie. Oh, yeah. And I had bad dreams about the hand hands. coming. That is her. That's, that's her hand? That's Yeah. They said, you know, you don't have to do it, and she wanted to do it. So uh, Jack, who's my uncle, had built a little box. set, like a little box for her to be in when they had these rocks and stuff. And yeah. Taxi driver. Taxi driver. Lots of crazy things happen in this movie. Yes, they um, do. He creates this uh, concealed sleeve gun that he has it rigged on a spring where it, he can do a motion and the gun ends up in his hand. And this is kind of neat because you actually get to see the process of him building it on camera, which you know you don't always get to see. Um, Wild Wild West is a television show. The main guy in that had, had one of these. It's such a cool, iconic part of this movie uh, and one of the best movies of the decade. With the Wild Wild West, that one came from a prop house. Stembridge, they've long been out of business. But the, what makes this so iconic is you see him build the prop on camera, which is also yeah. very difficult for a prop person because you're right. having to match his cuts and everything. When someone thought of the sleeve gun, they don't think of Wild Wild West. Yeah, I mean, this is the one you think about. Yeah, you think sleeve gun, gun. you think taxi driver. Yeah, you know, it was a real thing, though. Uh, It was invented World War II by Hugh Reeds. The scene with him, the are you talking to me, famously is uh, all improv, as far as those lines. Mm -hmm. I think in the script it had, you know, uh, Travis looks in the mirror and talks to himself. Right. You talking to me? You talking to me? You talking talking to to me? me? I'm the the only only one one here. here. Well, I'm the only one here, huh? Okay. Last, but certainly not least, is an iconic prop that's so iconic, it is in the title of the movie, which Mm -hmm. is the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, 1974, Toby Hooper, Leatherface. Here we see him doing the chainsaw dance that Gunnar Hansen, the actor, improvised. It's the very ending of the film. And when you're a prop master, you should always beware of a movie where the prop is in the title. This was like an independently made movie that they shot in Central Texas around Austin. This was a chainsaw that one of the investors of the movie had in his garage. That's a Poulin, isn't it? It's some conflicting information. Some people say it's Poulin 306A. Some people say it's a Poulin 245A. And I think the 245 is listed more commonly. Originally it was green, but they painted it yellow and then they just covered the uh, logo with some electrical tape. And they only had one, right? They had one. One is none. What we commonly say on the prop crew is one is none, two is one, and you should have a third just for fun. What they would do is whenever they were using it to make it safe, they would put a chain on it that had no teeth that they were filed down and they would take the clutch out of it so that it would spin more freely, smoke, make that real loud revving sound, which is kind of iconic, the sound itself. And then the scenes where it had to actually cut stuff, they would put the chain back on and put the clutch back in. And there is a scene where Leatherface, towards the end, he falls and the chainsaw goes onto his leg. They put a metal plate on the actor's leg, a piece of meat and fake blood all over it, and then the fabric or jeans, and they did the real saw. Oh no. It heated the metal up from friction so much that it burned his leg. How? Yeah. Like there's a picture right before they're gonna do it. 
Oh, wow. So he's holding it. God. Mm -hmm. And that's Toby Hooper with the, I don't know why he's got the bullhorn. <laughs> it's like the whole crew is right there. I mean, that, that is the whole crew. It hurts. <laughs> I don't You'll know. be fine. Yeah. <laughs> Action. I don't, I don't really understand that picture. Thanks for watching Iconic Props of the 1970s. Let us know in the comments what decade you want us to do next. Where's the joke, Scott? Can't you pull a pun out of your sleeve? I can. That's iconic. Oh,